Are we on back there? We are. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, if you would. And we're going to look at verse 8 down to verse number 15. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 8. Down to verse number 15. If you find your place, let's stand. We'll follow along as I read. In verse number 8, the Bible says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. You ought to think about that verse right there. We say we're saved tonight. Are we living for God? If He walked through those doors right now, and walk down here and point it at every one of us, could we say, I'm acceptable right now? That's what the Bible says. Amen. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, yes. that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We know what the terror of the Lord is. I don't think we understand the depths or the magnitude of what it'll be on the loss. But because of that, we ought to be persuading everybody we come in contact with. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause." Mm -hmm. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. But look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live what? Unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit of God that takes the Word of God and drives it into our heart and opens our mind and allows us to see the truth and what we really need to be. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would just encourage our hearts. I pray you'd challenge each one of us not to just go through the motions of Christianity and be mediocre, but, Lord, that we would be on fire for you and that we would make a difference in this world for the cause of Christ. And we're going to just thank you for what you do tonight. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Now I want you to notice that last verse where it says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I drew a line from live to the words unto him. We need to live unto him. Amen. We need to live for him, for his glory. This week, my wife and I, we have a satellite, not satellite, we've got that little thing on the antenna on the roof and we can get uh, different things and we get the prime video thing and we've been looking for stuff that you can watch. Not much you can watch on there, amen? But we saw some testimonies. The first one we saw was of Fanny Crosby. How many of you heard of Fanny Crosby? Fanny Crosby came from a home that had quite a lot of, uh, of religious uh, overtones, I would say, but Fanny Crosby was not saved until she was older in life after she had been blind. And I think about this. There was a young lady that by all rights and means, even in that day and age, probably should have just thrown her hands up and say, woe is me. I can't do anything in life. But you know what Fanny Crosby did? She lived unto God and gave everything she had to him. And I think about this, I was telling Pastor as we looked at it, she had written, and this is just him, she wrote poems as well, but over 9,000 hymns she wrote. And she had over 200 pseudonames that she went by so everybody wouldn't lift the name of Fanny Crosby up and brag on her. She had all these different names so nobody knew where they came from, but they literally came from Fanny Crosby. And it was all because she lived unto God. And then we watched another one. How many ever heard of C.H. Spurgeon? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Spurgeon came up in a religious home, and maybe I think was his dad a pastor? Somebody in the family was pastor. His grandfather was a pastor. But Spurgeon struggled. He struggled terribly. And it shows us he's walking through the countryside in the middle of a snowstorm at 15 years old. And he, he was so miserable. He said, I know that I'm not right. He said, the sin in my life is so terrible. And I can't imagine what it's like to God. And because of that storm, he snuck into a little church. There was only half a dozen people. And a young pastor was preaching. And when he preached, Spurgeon got under conviction and Spurgeon got saved. Do you realize that Spurgeon preached to thousands and thousands of people every week? Yeah. 
And the only reason was because he gave himself unto God. Amen. He was living for God. He was 16 years old when he took that first church and the church was declining. It was terrible. And it was within just months, they were running over 2,000 and people came from everywhere to hear Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But the reason was, is because he eventually gave himself and he was living unto God. And then the last one we saw was Billy Graham. Everybody knows Billy Graham. Billy Graham came out of a, a family that were dairy farmers. He lived on a farm most of his youth. And Billy Graham never got saved till he was 16 years old. He bounced in and out of different uh, schools. And then he finally went to some Bible schools. He almost got kicked out of Bob Jones University. And Bob Jones Sr. said to him, he said, son, don't throw your life away. He said, you've got a voice that is commanding it. God can use you. You know what Billy Graham did? Billy Graham never believed the, the authenticity of the scripture until he was 26 years old. 25 or 26 years old, he said, I really didn't know that, I didn't think the Bible was true all the way through until I was 25 or 26 years old. They had videos on there last night of, I could not believe the stadiums that were filled to overflow capacity and the close-up shots of people weeping and sobbing as they were getting under conviction to get saved. And, and Billy Graham, I mean, he was a barnstorm preacher. But you know Why? because he gave himself unto the Lord. Amen. And I want you to think tonight about that, about the fact that we need to give ourselves unto God. Over the weeks, you know, I have preached and pastors preaching about it, but about all that Christ has done for us. Amen. And he has. Well, and sit out to those lackadaisical attitude like, well, you know, uh, we hear this all the time. You know, I don't know that we hear it enough. We could hear it seven days a week and have it pumped into our heads and, and probably still don't understand the full depth of what he's done for us. Right. And we ought to be living for him. And I think that we all realize that his sacrifice, his sacrifice of what he's done ought to motivate us. Every time I go through the gospels and I get to the part before they crucified him and they scourged him and all they did to him, you know what? It makes me cringe. I can't believe that mankind did what they did to the Son of God. And we ought to be motivated more in our life when we think about what he's done, and not less. We ought to be doing more for him. And I think without a doubt, by, by self-sacrifice in our lives, and that's what these people have done, Fanny Crosby and C.H. Spurgeon and Billy, uh, Billy Graham is what they did, is they gave themselves, they gave them wholly uh, unto the Lord the things of God. And we ought to do that in every area of our life. And we ought to never, we ought to never quit. Persevere. I look out here even now, since we started the church, there were people that were here in the beginning that are not here now. Over the years, Pastor Granny, Pastor 25 years in California, I'll guarantee you there were people that sat in the pews that were on fire for God at one time, but now they're nowhere to be found. Why? Because they would not give themselves unto the Lord. We cannot quit. We must persevere. We've got to go on. And we need to live every day of our life in victory, not defeat. You know the devil wants to defeat us. Look what's going on right now in the United States of America. You look at this Democratic National Convention that's going on, it's absolutely the most bogus thing that's ever happened. And the only reason is, it's trying to take down a man that is over our country now that's trying to make, bring America back. Amen? Amen? And if the devil will do that to the United States of America, don't kid you, he's going to do it to the foundation of this nation, and that's the families in America. And we need to put all our confidence, every bit of our confidence in him. I thought about when Billy Graham said that I didn't believe in the authority of the scripture until I was 25 or 26 years old. We can't have any questions about that. The Bible is true from cover to cover and the cover included in it. Amen. And never doubt what he's doing and never doubt or question the work he's trying to do in our lives. He makes no mistake. You say, but we're going through a hard time right now. We've got tragedy in life. We've got this in our life. Don't second guess what God is doing. Right. God knows exactly what he's doing. And what I want to do tonight is I want to look at how we can live unto him and glorify our Lord with our lives. I want you to look over at John 15 and verse 5 through 8. You know how we can glorify the Lord and we can live unto him? We can do it as a branch that bears fruit. I think about this over here in John chapter 15. We all know this passage of scripture. And I think a lot of people interpret this as being souls being saved, but I don't think that's what it is. 
Before you can get souls saved, you have to have another fruit in your life, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Look what it says. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withereth, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Boy, I've been thinking about this, and I've been adding notes to this outline all afternoon. But I think about this. You may have a, a healthy vine. You know, out here, in, we have different vineyards in this area. You could have a really healthy vine. I mean, it's beautiful and it's flourishing. But if you don't have any branches, guess what? You're not going to have any fruit. Right. Because the vine itself does not bear the fruit. It's the branch where the fruit grows. And, and I think about this. We're the only way that the world is ever going to see Christ. Right. We're the branches. We're the ones that need to, to bear the fruit of the Spirit that the world can see it. And as a result, the world is drawn unto Christ. And I, I thought about this when I wrote it down. I thought somebody's going to take this wrong. We definitely need the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But let me throw this one out. He needs us too. Right. Because he is the what? Vine. We are the branches. If we are not connected to the vine and the branches are not there, there's not going to be anything accomplished for Christ on this right. earth. Right. And think about this. I don't care who you are tonight, whether you're young, whether you're old, you're in between, you say, well, I really don't make a difference. I don't count. We all count if we're saved. Yeah. Right. Everybody in here tonight. And we ought to have the attitude that I can go out because the power of God is available to me and I can go out and I can be a witness and I can bear fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ if we will just live unto him. Amen. Amen. Uh, also, most folks can, uh, can identify a tree by just looking at the tree. Uh, a lot of people, some people, if they're timber people, they can. But if you go out and there's a tree and that tree, the leaves are gone and everything's off, at, you go out there and you look and say, oh, I wonder what kind of tree that is. When can you tell what kind of tree it is? When the fruit is on. And that's the same thing for you and I. You and I are the branches and we're the ones that should bear the fruit of God. And, and the, the message of God goes forth through us. Now, I want you to think about this. How many of you have you've gone over and look at Galatians 5 and look at verse 22 for, to verse number 23. The fruit that needs to be seen in our lives is found in these two verses. Now, all of us have read these, and I know pastors read it just recently, and, and he gave definitions, but I want to give you some de definitions that were in Strong's, and these are long definitions, but I want you to think about it. The fruit that we need to bear is found in these two verses, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Number one, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. As a branch, you and I need to bear and display the love of God. Now, that's the word agape. Now, here's the definition of found. It says the love of God is the first duty of man. Wow, first duty of man. And this love springs from a realistic view of his attributes and the excellencies of his character. My goodness, our God is perfect. Amen. And the love that he has bestowed upon us is perfect, and we ought to have that love being displayed on others. And then it goes on. It says, his character, which brings the highest delight to the sanctified heart, to esteem and reverence him in every way and to have a fear of offending him is its inseparable effect. If we are having the love of Christ in our heart, in our life, we're going to display it to the world. But not only that, that love is going to be proven because we never want to let him down. Amen. We don't ever want to break the heart of God. And our love for him is displayed and the world sees that. But then look at the second one, it's joy. As a branch, we must display joy. Here's the definition. The delight of the mind from the, the consideration of a present possession. You know, you just got a brand new truck. Boy, you know, you have joy over that, right? Because you can see it, it's right there. But what about this? It's also or the assurance of an approaching possession. You know you're going to get a new one down the road. That brings you joy too. Man, I bought a new truck for myself. I had the money. But guess what? Kimmy, I'm buying you a new car. 
That's a joyful thing if you got the money to do it, amen? amen. <laughs> you all looking at me like Kev looking at the new gate. <laughs> but what is the thing that we're looking forward to? The fact that we got saved ought to bring us joy, amen? amen. That's in the present. But you ought to think about the joy that just looked forward to the one day we're going to be in heaven. Right. And listen, a lot of Christians walk around, you talk about the frumpy lip. I talk about that all the time. You walk around with your lip hanging down. What kind of a branch is that? Nobody say, man, I don't want the kind of fruit you got. Look what it did to your lip. <laughs> Amen. But then look at the next one. As branches, we need to display peace. Here's the definition given. To be at peace is to be reconciled. To live in harmony. To make peace is to reconcile with parties at variance. To hold your peace is to be silent and to suppress one's thoughts and not to speak. We ought to be peacemakers. Amen. We ought to be one that are, that are right with people. Anybody that we know we're at odds with and we can make that difference, we ought to do it. That's what we ought to be displaying as the branches for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not running around with grudges, with unforgiveness and everything else. We ought to be peacemakers. Amen. But then here's the other one, long-suffering. Oh, this is a good one. Bearing injuries for a long time, patient, not easily made angry. How long is your fuse of patience? Who said that? Oh, Joe, how long is yours? Okay. <laughs> you didn't see that. I said, how long is your fuse? He said, about that long. <laughs> but that's, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. How often do we think about this? about the love and the joy and the peace. This is what we need to be portraying. And if we're living unto God and our life is dedicated to him, these things ought to be inseparable in our lives. Yeah. And then look at the next one, gentleness. As a branch, we need to display gentleness. Uh, the definition, softness of manner, mildness of temper, sweetness of disposition. Wow. You're just a gentle, silly savage. Amen. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> then the next one, goodness. Goodness is defined as uprightness of heart and life, possessing and displaying moral qualities which constitute Christian excellence and moral virtue. Amen. Wow. Hey. Then here's another one. Uh, these are all part of the fruit of the Spirit. You say, but that's more than one fruit. No, it's one fruit with many characteristics. Amen? Amen. I always use that apple. An apple, it, it may be one piece of fruit, but there's a lot of characteristics. It's the color of the outside, the, can, the texture of the inside, the flavor, everything about it. It's one fruit with different characteristics. That's the same with the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. But then look also, if you would, at meekness. Here's a definition. Softness of temper, exercising patience under injuries and provocation. Whoa! Uh, in a spiritual sense, humility, submission to the divine will of God without murmuring, opposed to pride and arrogance. Now, we've all heard definitions, but I'm going to be honest, this is the first time I heard it in detail like that. And this applies to us because we are the branches on the vine and this is the fruit we ought to be displaying to the world. And then, of course, the last one, I love this one, and that's temperance. It means moderation, habitual moderation. You know what habitual means? It means all the time. You say, well, I'm, I'm pretty moderate most of the time, but you know when somebody twists my tail, man, I blow up. <laughs> What's wrong in here tonight? Come on, you guys. Modera moderation, habitual moderation of the natural appetite and passions and also... Uh, drunkenness and other physical indulgence. In other words, it means self-control over all of those things. Amen. Amen. Uh, and we ought to do this all for the Lord. Yeah. It's not for us. It's for the Lord that we might bring glory unto him. That word unto him ought to stick in our mind. What we do ought to be unto him Amen. and not for self. And then secondly, Mo, we got to hurry. I'm going to do a Pastor Granny message here. You know what? I struggle with that for him, but I have to be honest. 
the Lord has blessed our pastors preaching and it doesn't drive anybody away. It draws the people to our church. Keep on preaching, brother. Amen. But then look at Matthew 5, 14 through 16. We can also glorify and bring glory unto the Lord as a light that shines. And the Bible says that we are the light. We should shine. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Thee did a man light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I remember years ago, and I, I've mentioned this several times, but I was reading about the culture during Bible times, and in the average family, they lived in just a basically square house. They weren't very big. Had stairs going up to the roof. It had a, a roof that was made out of, of logs and brush and clay. They packed it down. That's what they call the tiling of a roof. But in that house, there wasn't very much. But one of the things they had was a bushel basket. The bushel basket during the day was used as an implement to carry and transport things. But at night, you know what the bushel basket was for? It was the lampstand. That's where they put their candle at night. They didn't put it under the bushel. They put it on top. And you say, well, what was so big a deal about that? If you went by a house and there was no light, they would think nobody lived there, number one. But if you went by a house and there was no light, they would think you were not friendly. Now, think about that with us. We're to be the light of the world. I think about this. When we're right with God and living for him, we will automatically illuminate light. What happens when the lights go out? What's the first thing you look like when darkness comes? What are you looking for? You're looking for light. And you think about the world today. We live in a world that's lost in, in sin. It's black. It's getting blacker and darker and darker all the time. And you mark this down. There's people out there. We've seen them right here in our service in the last month that have got saved in the service. What are they looking for? They're looking for light. And you and I, as the branches on the vine, need also to be the light of the world that they can see Christ in us and that they would desire to have him. I think about John 12, 32, it says, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Yes. Listen, we're the light. We're the light that shines. It shines out the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. It shines out all of that and that draws people to Christ. None of us should ever be self-exalted. And I know that's a tough thing. I've been guilty of that so much in my life, it makes me sick. You say, really? Yeah, I'm being honest with you. When we do that, you know who gets no glory? God gets no glory. And what we ought to do, everything we do, should bring glory unto him. Amen. And then also to glorify God, be, we need to be the branches that bear the fruit. We need to be the light that shines for him. But then we need to also be the witness that testifies for him. Amen. When's the last time you handed out a track? And I know our church, we got great people, but I know there are people here tonight that you probably don't hand out a track. You don't witness to anybody. I'm not trying to scold you. I'm trying to encourage you because one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to give account for that. Right. We're going to give account for what we have said and what we have done and how we've tried to reach the world. I'm glad there was a man that came to my house in 1975. Amen. I'm glad I had a wife that was angelic in her being. You say she was angelic? Yep, she was always up in the air about that high harping on me to go to church, amen? <laughs> and she wasn't even saved. She got saved after I, the week after I got saved. But I'm glad there were people that went out and they were sharing what Christ had done in their life. I think of the word witness. It means a person who tells of what they have personally seen or experienced. And everybody in here tonight that's saved, you have a story from the youngest to the oldest. Uh, you can tell of how you got under conviction or where you were at when the conviction came. And you can tell what it was like the moment you got saved. I ran from, I didn't want to go to church. That's when I was big time in rodeo. We roped every night in the summer. We roped every weekend. We traveled. And I didn't have any, any time for this church thing. But my wife, that little harping angel, kept after me and after me and after me. And finally, I told her, I said, I'll make you a deal. One time, one time, that's it. And I still remember, I had an orange GMC pickup truck. 
I got dressed. I had a pair of Tony Lama, lizard wingtip, bone-colored boots on, western shoot, the belt, the whole nine yards. We got in the pickup truck, and we drove 25 miles out into Hudson, Colorado. And I was upset at that because the church, they were meeting in a house. The, the house was on a cul-de-sac, and we had to drive down this dusty, nasty old road. And then we had to park from here to the corner down their way because there was cars, and we had to walk down that gravel. I was not in a good mood. And we got to the house. Come here, Justin. I love to do this. Everybody here has seen this before. Here's the preacher. He's in his 70s. Little short white hair guy standing at the door. Get over here where they can all see this. They got to see this. Amen. He stuck out his hand and he said, I'm the, who are you? I'm the preacher. You're me. Okay. He stuck his hand out and he went, oh, Mr. Listen, it's so good to have you today. What are you shaking your head for, Terry? I was wiping my hand off after he got done, amen? And so we go in and we sit down and they're playing this music and I'm like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs already. But when that old man left that door and got down behind that pulpit, somebody put a tiger in his little tank and when he preached, he peeled the paint off the wall. I said, man, there's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Bring you in, skin you hide, and leave you go out wounded, amen? Well, anyway, so I'm leaving. And I'm on my way out. I said, howdy so I'm not going to do any more of this. And I get to the door, and there he was. Oh, Mr. Listen, it was so good to have you today. Amen? But I remember a week later, I didn't get saved then, man. I ran to the truck, and I beat feet home. Amen? But a week later, like all good preachers, you know what he did? He made that visit on Amen. Saturday. And for the new ones, oh, Donnie and his family, they've never heard this, so I'll tell it for them. He gets to the house, and I don't know he's coming. I have two dogs. I had an Australian shepherd. His name, registered name was Deacon's Prophecy. I had a Blue Healer's registered name was Preacher's Promise. Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth for the first time. Anyway, uh, and so we called him Preacher and Deacon for short. Well, Deacon was vicious. I mean, he would eat you up one side and down the other if nobody was outside. And the preacher was learning to be like the deacon. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> and... Uh, so this car pulls up, and I see the dogs. They start barking, and they head for that car, and I knew what they were doing. They were already biting at the front tires on the cars. It's rolling to a stop, and I said, yep, they're going to get them. So they, they start to open the doors, and I said, preacher, deacon, get out here. And boy, the dogs come running down. I said, lay down. Boy, they laid down, and I look up, and here's these two guys running right straight for me. And I thought, what in the world's going on here? They're running after me, and then I realized who it was. It was that little preacher and somebody else with him. Well, I'm going to shorten this up best I can. He talked to me a little bit and I couldn't wait for him to leave. And he said, you know, we'd really like to talk to your wife and children. I said, I'd love for you to talk to my wife and children. I said, go right up there to the stairs, walk up on the deck, knock on the door. She's there. Oh, but Mr. Lislin, we'd like you to come with us. And I remember that day I didn't want to go. And I said, if you go up there self, you're going to be in trouble. And sure enough, I went up there I sat on this three-cushioned early American couch as close to the arm as I could get. There was all this couch left. That old man slid right up next to me. <laughs> and then he talks to my wife and the children, and he said, oh, by the way, this man is deacon so-and-so. Well, now I understood preacher and deacon. Amen. And so he's talking to him for a while, and then he very abruptly turns, and he said, I want to ask you something. And I said, see, he's going to ask you something. You have no idea what you're going to tell him. He said, if you died right now, where would you spend eternity? I said, sir, the way I've lived, I would go to hell. I've done everything short to kill somebody and be a sodomite. He said, yep, that's where you go. He said, do you want to go there? 27 years old, the first time in my life I acknowledged, I said, I don't think anybody wants to go to hell. Mm -hmm. You think you're a tough guy, you think you're a tough lady, and you're here tonight and you're not saved and you've been putting it off and you know what right is. Let me tell you what, you're not tough, you're dumb. I worked construction. I was a fitter. I worked on big construction jobs, put my life in danger oftentimes on high jobs. But that day I realized that I wasn't as tough as I thought I was. And he said, if I could tell you how to get to heaven, would you do it? And I said, no, sir, because you don't know how to get there any better than I do. I thought I had it. He said, you're right, I don't. But then he reached in his coat. He pulled out a little leather book. Amen. He said, if I can show you in here, would you do what this says? I says, what is that? He said, it's the Bible. I said, if you think you can show me in the Bible, I said, I'll do it. Amen. Well, that was the day I got saved. Amen. You know what? That's a testimony. And it doesn't have to be that long. But I could have just said, you know what? My wife 
begged me to go to church. I went to church. I heard the preaching, didn't know what it was. A week later, they came by and took the Bible and showed me, and I got saved. We all have a testimony. And I'm going to tell you, if we're going to live unto him, that testimony is going to be very special. Because other people that we come in contact with, you know what? They think they're different than a Christian. Honestly. Uh, some of the toughest people I've ever seen that you just, you just dreaded to go to their house to talk to them and to witness to because they were the big tough people. You found out that they had the soft, tender heart that was waiting for somebody to tell them about the Lord. But I, if we can glorify God and we can be a, a, a witness unto him, and that's what it's all about. I wonder tonight, if you were asked to stand and give your testimony personally, could you do it right now? And if you couldn't, you ought to think about that and you ought to do something about it. But then look at John 13 and verse 12 through 17. I want you to see this also. We can glorify God by bearing fruit and by shining as a light and by being a testimony, giving our testimony of what he's done in our life. But then also we glorify him by being servants that serve. And again, I, I compliment Faith Baptist Church people. Our Saturday morning meetings, when we have something going on, just look at the, the, the uh, fundraiser we're doing there. Our people are involved, but not everybody is involved the way they should be. I want you to look at John 13 and verse 12 through 17. It says, so after he had washed their feet and he had taken his garments, he was set down again. He said unto them, know ye what I have done to you. You call me master and Lord, and you say, you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, now notice this, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Often the work of the ministry doesn't get much dignity. There's not much glamour in the ministry, but you know what? It's got to be, and we all have to serve. I appreciate those that clean our church, who come and clean the church. Uh, we have those that mow the grass, and we take care of this place. We all ought to serve God, and when we do it, we're not doing it to get some kind of self-gratification or somebody patting us on the back, but we're doing it as unto the Lord, and that's what he wants us to do, as unto him. Uh, I, I think sometimes people want to hear the applause. And I, there's nothing wrong with somebody coming up and say, hey, you did a great job. I think that's great. But that ought to be the motive of why we serve. We ought to serve because we want to do it unto the Lord. Amen. And I think about this. But our Lord said we would be happy if we would do as he has already done. And you know what that is? That's just to be a servant. I think of when he took that, that towel, which was a tool of a servant, and he girded himself with that, and he got down and he washed the feet. You say, is that what he wants us to do? I think he was just setting an example that we ought to be willing to humble ourselves and do whatever the task might be. It's pretty humbling to get down and wash somebody's feet. Some feet in here probably you wouldn't even want to see them unsocked. Amen. But we ought to be servants for God. I think about this. How, how can we serve? Well, we live every day for the Father. Every day. We be faithful to whatever God has called us to. And where God sends us, that's where we'll go. Whatever God tells us to speak, that's what we'll speak. And we'll never quit. And we'll suffer if need be. And we'll be willing to sacrifice the other. Do you remember where Paul said, I'm willing to spend and be what? Spent. That ought to be our attitude as well. I think there's great satisfaction in being obedient and doing exactly what God wants. But we have to do it unto him. And then the last thing, and I'll quit, is this. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 through 4. We can glorify God by being soldiers ready for the fight. Jeez. And there's a battle going on, folks. Right. It is a spiritual battle today in our country and around this world. I think about when we prayed tonight, and I don't know if it's changed, but uh, the Batotos, wasn't it uh, that they weren't getting their, their support and stuff because of the mail or the banks. You know, there's a battle going on and the devil's fighting all over this world. He doesn't want our missionaries to get the gospel out. He doesn't want the churches in America to get the support to the missionaries. And we need to be ready for the fight. And that's how we can live unto God. Look at there at 2 Timothy 1, 2 and verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in 
Christ Jesus. Boy, that word grace, since preacher preached on that, has had a whole lot greater bearing in my life than it ever has before. It's the grace of God that we get this stuff done. Yes. And the thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses is saying, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a what? Good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I think too many times we let the things of this life deter us from doing what God wants us to do. It deters us from being in the battle the way we ought to be in. Uh, there will never be in this life an end to the battles against sin, self, Satan, and society. There won't. There's never going to be an end to it. And we've got, we can't let the cares of this life and of the affairs that are going on around us to hinder us from the work of Christ. And when we fight the battle and we fight the fight, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it unto him because he's worthy. We should never let down our guard. And I think of these last verses and we'll be done. Look, if you would, at Ephesians chapter 6. And this is how we ought to be prepared. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. We need to always be properly and fully equipped. You say, well, I got part of it, but I don't have it all. We need to have it all. I think about a, a soldier would go into battle if he had one part of the armor that was missing. You say he put his breastplate on. Well, that's good. That protect the vitals in the front. But what if he turned around and he didn't have the armor on the back? What if he didn't have on the, the, the armor on his legs and they'd hit him in the legs and knock a leg out? He wouldn't be able to go on and fight. All of these things are important. Look what it says. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Boy, wouldn't that be good? We could see him. You could get a club or a gun or whatever and cut him up or shoot him down. But that's not the way it is. And we have to be spiritually prepared as it describes in these verses. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. How many times has it said that? Twice. The whole armor of God, that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. We ought to be people of truth. We ought to accept untruths in our life. We not, never speak untruths with our mouth, but we need to live in truth. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, the breastplate. Where, where is the attack coming? What causes us to fail on God? It's when our heart is not right and our heart gets hard. And the breastplate of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now is the time for enduring, not for retreating in the battle. And I think over the years, I know Kevin's been on the road, I think he told me the other day, 30 years. We were on the road 26 years in the ministry now, almost 45 years, and I guarantee you there's a lot of retreating going on. Yes. Where Kevin would once preach or I once would preach, they don't want you anymore because they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to ripple the pond. Now's not a time for us to back up. Now's a time for us to stand our ground and go Amen. forward. Right. And all for the Lord Jesus. It all needs to be done unto him. What we need to be is we need to be the branches that bear fruit. We need to be the light that shines in the world. We need to be the one that can testify of the greatness and the wonders that God has done in our life. And we need to be the servants that will serve and the soldiers that will fight Amen. and not back up. I wonder tonight, I, I hope that you think about that and it's an encouragement. We all need, we all need work. Amen? And that old song, he's still working on me Amen. to make me what I ought to be. There's nobody in here tonight that's perfect. And we ought to think about these things and not just say, well, we hear that and we've heard it before and, and we know all that. But what are we doing with what we hear? It's not just to be a hearer of the word, but what does the Bible say? To be a what? Doer of the word as well. And I hope tonight that's the case for all of us. I know the Lord spoke to my heart. And I, even though all the years I've been in the ministry and been saved, I don't want to go back. I want to go forward for God. And I had those testimonies the other night of the blind lady, Fanny Crosby, 
of Spurgeon and of Billy Graham, of people who started out as grassroots just like we are, Fanny Crosby in a whole lot worse state. But look what God did with them because they gave their lives unto him. Amen. And that can be the same thing Amen. for everybody at Faith Baptist Church. Amen. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder tonight if there might be one, just one in here tonight. You're not saved. You know you're not saved. You've been playing church, going.